off. My name is Gail Trell, and today is Thursday, May 19th, 2011. And I'm here at the home of Morton Ellie Lowenthal to interview them for the Jewish Historical Society Oral History. Um, uh, I'd also like to let you know that Marcy Schoenfeld is the videotographer. And I have been so excited about this time to, in to do the interview, so let's get started. <laughs> So good afternoon. Thank you. So glad to have this chance to be with you and have an opportunity to have the Jewish Historical Society know a little bit about you. So you can tell us what you want. So we're going to start from the beginning. If you can tell us a little bit about your families um, and how, how far back you know, like where they came from, what country, and when, when you were born. That would come up after you... Uh, Tell us where they're from. So it's ladies first, is that what you say? My um, parents were um, born in, in New York City. Um, their parents were, bor were born, um, my father's in, in England, and my mother's in Poland and Austria, came over to this country in the early 1900s. And um, we stayed in the area for all this time. We've never really left the East. Would you share their names with us? Yes. Um, my mother and father was uh, Sydney and Sadie Levine. Uh, what? Here. Well, I'm going to go back and do mine, so. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, on, on my uh, father's side, it was um, Betsy and Arthur, Le uh, Arthur Levine. Okay. And when were you born? I was born uh, in 1933, New York City. Mort and I were born at the same hospital two years apart. It gets worse than that, we went to the same high school. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, my family, both my set of grandparents were born here. Their parents came from, one parent set came from Russia, and one came from Austria. My father was born in Philadelphia. My mother was born in New York City. My father's family, obviously, was low and tall. Mm -hmm. His father was a tailor. And my other grandparents' name was Albert. And Benjamin Albert was uh, a prosperous business person who started a well-known egg, butter and egg company, Albert Gerber, actually, which I used to go to when I was a boy. And uh, my grandmother's name, his wife's name was Bessie, so it was Benjamin and Bessie. They always lived in New York. And I was born, as we talked about, in the same hospital, in New York, Doctor's Hospital. And we lived, uh, I lived first in New York City, within a block of the Yankee Stadium, actually. And then we moved to Teaneck and went to elementary school in Teaneck, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Then moved to Larchmont and went to high school, junior high, high school at Larchmont. Do you want a little yeah, bit of your education? Yeah, sure. Going back, um, my grandfather on my father's side came from England. He, uh, let, he lied about his age when he was 15 and, and uh, joined the British Army and fought in the Boer War and deserted and came to this country and started as an apprentice in a print shop. He knew he had a distant cousin living in Troy, New York. He went up there, found my grandmother, married came back to New York and started his own printing business, which later my father joined. Mm -hmm. So, uh, And then some of your education? Uh, well, as uh, I started in um, PS81 in Riverdale and then came to the Maranek, went through the uh, elementary schools there, and uh, Maranek High School. And then went on to, um, I don't know if you want to go on to college, but uh, shall I continue with that? You can go that? college and we'll go college. Okay. Um, I went to uh, Tyler School of Fine Arts at Temple University in Philadelphia. That's my education. That's your education. I graduated from Marnock High School, went to Cornell, was a chemical engineering student, five-year course, graduated in 54, class of 53, 
that went to Harvard Business School, right out of college. Mm -hmm. We got married before I graduated Cornell. Ellie helped put me through the business school. She worked and I supposedly studied. Okay. But we both did uh, nefarious things at lunchtime because we spent lunchtime ice skating. Ah. That's true. Every single day. So actually, how did you, I know you went to the same high school. Is that when you met? Mm -hmm. Well, we, we knew each other. other. That's not what we met. We didn't think. My sister was in, well, in a lot of my classes. She was a year younger, and so I knew her in high school. And I was over at his house. He didn't remember because part of the time he was off at college, but I was spend a lot of time at his house uh, where his sister was. Is that a little Could cricket? It, yeah, is it a... We have this wonderful clicking, cricking next to us. What is that all about? Well, outside when it rains in this season, the frogs are just hatched. So they do this all night, and there's literally dozens and dozens of frogs. You know, hear them in all directions, and there's no way to stop. You're in the back here, and you're over here, okay, and so, you're over there. So as the person who is viewing this video will understand that it's the frogs who are chirping along, or whatever they croaking. They're mm -hmm. croaking. Okay. They're happy. So we were at how you met, or when you started to well, we get can together. Back, we can go back one step because it's, I guess the most important thing of my boyhood was Boy Scouts, and I got involved at the normal age of twelve, and became an Eagle Scout, young Eagle Scout. And really took it very seriously, and then went on became a junior assistant scoutmaster, went to scout camp, and then when I grew up, and after I graduated, we can talk later. I became a scoutmaster here at Stanford. And that was an important part of my boy. Ellie's girlhood, something else was important. Sailing. Sailing. <laughs> yeah, I was a sailor from the time I was very young. My father was a very interesting man. He could do almost anything, and he taught me almost everything that I know. And he was a sailor, and he was an ice skater, and he did about every sport you can imagine. Um, he went to school in the Bronx, and <clears throat> there were very few Jewish kids in the schools then, and he used to get in fights a lot, so his mother decided to send him to military school. And he went to military school in Pennsylvania, and there he played football and basketball and every sport you can imagine. And later on, went on to college, was a, was a football player at college, uh, quarterback, and uh, was self-taught in so many things. And he taught himself to sail and skate and every sport you can imagine. And he taught me that. He didn't have any sons, and I was his son. So I was treated as if I was a boy. And I learned everything there was to learn that a boy would learn. Mm -hmm. So, so you skate, you sailed? I started, started sailing with him at a young age. He taught me to sail. I got, had my own boat. I was sailing alone when I was eight years old. Uh, and then I went on to, you know, racing. Had a, uh, a Luda 16 class boat, which happened to be built in Stanford, uh, in the Luda shipyards that were here years ago. And um, was, um, that was my main thing that I did until I got married, until the day I got married, practically. Uh, was racing every weekend, Saturdays and Sundays, and skated, uh, sailed in international races, um, and uh, was a Long Island Sound champion for a couple of years in the 40s. So that was my main main thing that I did in the summertime and in the, in the wintertime. My father taught, us, taught me to skate, so I've been skating since I was two years old. And uh, we did that together. We did a lot of things together. So. Where did you sail? I'm Long Island Sound. Mostly yeah, Long Island Sound. Yeah, off of uh, Larch Mimer, Okay. Okay. Good idea. Um, so, we were talking about education. Did you have any kind of Jewish education? Well, my father, mostly, I went, I went to Hebrew school when I was very young, but my father, who taught Hebrew in, in New York City, um, really taught uh, our, our, my family, my, children, my sisters. And I, we didn't go on, you know, with our formal education. It was really every Sunday morning we were sat down with him. With him, he, yeah. That's and all through, uh, right, through until my children were born. And your family yeah. observed all the holidays. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. They were uh, 
very observant. Is it significant to mention where what synagogue you attended? Well, my grand my um, my grandfather founded the Jewish Jewish Center of University Heights and near the concourse, and uh, we would go down there for the main holidays. And my grandfather and father also uh, were very instrumental in in uh, starting the Westchester um, Synagogue, the on Palmer Avenue, mm -hmm. and. Uh, when there was no synagogue there. In fact, when we first moved there, there were no, there was one small conservative temple on Halstead Avenue, and that's where we went, just for regular, mm. uh, you know. There weren't very many Jews in Larchmont. No, and then they built the Larchmont Temple in Larchmont, and then the one that my grandfather and father were uh, involved in. And more, your Jewish education? I was Bar Mitzvah. I was actually Bar Mitzvah in my grandfather's temple in New York, but our family was not as religious mm -hmm. and didn't do much. We, we celebrated the major holidays, went to my grandparents and celebrated, but we weren't terribly religious. Okay. My Jewish education started later, and I got deeper into it. Right. So. right. Well, that's one of the reasons we ask that question. We are the yeah. Jewish Historical well, sure. Society. So. Well, a lot had to do with my father, too, right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot from your father. From mm -hmm. to your influence. Yeah. Did you have kosher homes or Shabbat candles or? Uh, I, well, we didn't have we didn't keep kosher, um, but um, we did observe Shabbat at my grandfather's when when I was young at my at my grandfather's place. At his okay. All right. So um, we have our education. You want to tell us a little bit out about your wedding when you finally were? We were married um, at the original estate where my grandfather had bought years ago and um, that you know a beautiful outdoor wedding in September. <laughs> well it was an interesting wedding. Oh yeah. Because we were married because their house was right up on Island Sound. And her parents' house was on an island in Marshmallow Harbor. And two days before the wedding, the hurricane came. And all the wedding presents were in the basement, of course, and the house got flooded, and the island got flooded. And it looked for sure like there was no possibility of having a wedding. It was a big wedding. But the day of the wedding came, and the sun came out. And it was a glorious day. But so, there, was, you know, there was a hurricane, and they, my, they had to quickly that morning get somebody to come in and cut the trees down. The trees were blocking the driveway. It was a mess. The place was a mess, but they cleaned it all up. My mother was in a dizzy because, oh, we're going to have to go to the synagogue and get, you know, we can't have the wedding here. But it all turned out, and it was, you know, like nothing happened. And what was the date? Um, well, it was the big hurricane in 1954. It was Edna, because the rabbi said we should name our first child Edna. <laughs> but there were two, there were two uh, hurricanes just before that. Uh, there was a D, which I don't remember the name, and then C was Carol. Hurricane Carol, which was ten days before that, so there was devastation throughout the whole area. And that just was before that. September. September, nineteen fifty-four. Okay. The day after the wedding, I matriculated. Our yeah. Business. We just drove up to Boston and went to start school right away, and I got a job. And doing what? Um, I was mounting insects. I got a job at the Museum of Comparative Zoology uh, at Harvard University and uh, mounted insects for two years, mostly ants. With a very famous person. And, and it turned out that the graduate student whose ants, I, most of the ants that I was mounting, became one of the most famous biologists in the country, E.O. Wilson. And also Tom Eisner, who recently passed away from Cornell. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I, uh, Wilson is still at Harvard. Okay, so we're talking about careers. You were just doing this while, um, what was at school, but what kind of careers did this education bring you to? Well, I was a chemical engineer, so what did I do? I went to work for an oil company, a big oil company, Mobile Oil, one of the few Jews in the management ranks, and worked for Mobile for 11 years. And where, was, where were you? Well, New York, primarily, but one year up in Buffalo Refinery. Mm -hmm. We got to Buffalo, I put my days in there, and they got called and come back, and they had a new position for me. So I spent 11 years with Mobile, mm -hmm. and I just changed careers and became an investment banker. Went to work for Donaldson, Lufkin, and Jen Rad, and subsequently for 
Where's that coming? Mm -hmm. And we can talk later about the things I did as, right. you know, as an investment banker. Okay. But Eleanor so, was doing something at that time, which was having children. Uh huh. And well, so tell us about your children. That's a good segue. Yeah, we have four children, four girls, very close in age. And you want to name them? Yes, Leslie is the oldest, Terry, Emily, and Meg. Uh, Terry and Emily live in Stanford. Leslie lives upstate New York, and Meg lives in the city. Mm -hmm. I spent most of my time when they were young with them. I mean, we did everything together. They did not go to preschool. We just had our own preschool here. And uh, they did a lot of activities, so I was driving around all over the place. <laughs> were you here in this home at the we time? We moved here about 1965, mm -hmm. but we were in another home on Timber Lane for seven years. We moved to yes. Stanford in 1959. But we built this home. We, we built, built the street, house. subdivided, and built this house in, in sections and in various states. But it took several years, but we built it. And the girls went to public school here in Stanford. They all graduated West Hill. Mm -hmm. okay. Three of them graduated. One didn't. The oldest one decided the oldest one, she didn't want to She didn't want to graduate, finish school. but she, she left school <laughs> one month before she was to graduate and said, I won't take a diploma because I don't believe in some of this stuff I'm, I've heard. She actually skipped a grade in second grade. And she, she was, was very, she got straight A's all through school without even working. <laughs> and she said, education is a waste of time. The I'm principal, just go out and work. The principal called up and said, if she would just come one day, they'll give her the diploma, and she can graduate. No. Oh. She took a job. <laughs> okay. Good. That's, that's true. She's very independent. So, um, we talked about, we, now that you've, have your family and you get involved with the community. This is one of the important parts of our interview today to see what you've given back to the community in all aspects of it, whether it be Jewish or community or civic or national. So who wants to start? You start. So some uh, of the things that you do well, in the community. Early on uh, when the children were young there was, I think I noticed something in the paper about needing tutoring in, in the public schools. Uh, in the early 60s, the schools were very crowded. We still, we had some schools that, that don't exist anymore, Stevens, Rice, and uh, they were very, they were primarily maybe 80% uh, uh, non-white and, uh, and maybe 30 or 40 in a class and they were, they really needed somebody to help out. And uh, I always love to, I always like to teach children or anybody who didn't have the privileges that I had. My children were, they just grew up, you know, doing all the things that we did and had a very privileged education. And I really enjoyed trying to work with children that didn't have those opportunities. And so I jumped at the opportunity. I don't remember the name of the organization, but um, we, I just called them and we had some kind of orientation and then we went into the schools and we, we tutored in the schools during the school time took some children out of the classrooms, and I did that for a lot of years. And when that program ended, I went, that we had des desegregation, so they were busing children up, and I was asked by some of the teachers up here in this area, Roxbury and those schools, to help out in the classrooms during the Tate time. So I really tutored over a period of 40 years or so. And then they, they brought the I Have a Dream program in, and I did that. It was pretty much, you know, continuous all the way through. So that was my extracurricular activity. I, I did a lot of, I had a lot of volunteer things. I've never had, pay, not had paying jobs since my original job. But it seems like I have a full-time job yeah. all the time. Absolutely, absolutely. If you think of anything as yeah. you go along, you certainly can remind us. And more, your community yeah, involvement is... My first community involvement was not Jewish. It was entirely civic did a lot of civic things. It started out as we formed a Human Rights Commission in Stanford. I was the chair of the Human Rights Commission. That was during the Martin Luther King era. And you know, things were pretty hot here in Stanford. In fact, the night that 
Reverend King was shot. There was a riot downtown, and you know, we tried everything we could, along with the police, to calm people. And did a lot of things which weren't publicized to keep the lid on that. But I think the Human Rights Commission really was an instrumental thing in this city. The next thing I did was police, of all things, and I became chair of the police commission. The police were in a sorry state in this city at one time. We had a non-professional police chief who was the former postmaster. And so I walked into this situation and we brought it in, a professional, somebody from out of town, called Victor Sizankis, which really stirred the pot. And we had many <laughs> troubling days uh, trying to get the police department organized, but we integrated it and we made it professional and yeah, I think I'm proud of what we did there. Uh, the other thing I got involved in because of my Human Rights Commission was in the black community. Uh, Dr. Yearwood became a very good friend. She was a black physician in town. And there was a small black community center at the foot of West Main Street. When Stephen's school was closed, which we can talk about why it was closed, we decided that would be a great place to build a black community center. So we took over Stephen's school, took the school down except for the gym and built what is now Yearwood Center. I guess one of the things we can all be proud of is that many of the people on the board of Yearwood Center for that time, I was chair for many years, were Jewish. Sidney uh, Kweskin was on the board. Uh, uh, Renee Benningson was on the board for many years. And there were a whole crew of us that really worked to make that a, a viable community center. But the thing that really took the most time was integration of the schools. And the schools were completely segregated at that time. You had three schools that had 80 plus percent blacks. The rest of the schools were basically white. And the country was starting to talk about what was going on. And we decided we were going to wait for the country. We are going to try to do it our way. So we formed a large committee of parents. And we had some school administrators, some teachers, mostly parents, that worked for about a year and came out with what came to be known in the paper was the Laurenthal Report, which was to integrate all the schools. And that was, the community accepted it, the Board of Education voted on it, and we literally integrated the schools before the rest of the country, which entailed massive busing. I mean, it changed the city. But everybody felt that you just couldn't have three black schools. And that's how Stevens School was finally closed, because that was one of the black schools. And now that we try to integrate the school, the, the three, Rice, Ryle, and Stevens, all were closed, and the blacks were distributed to the other schools, and it changed Stanford. So that kept me busy. I guess the other thing that was involved in them was Cornell. I was very active. Cornell alumni was head of the admissions committee and then finally president of the alumni association for four years. Mm -hmm. The International Alumni Association. I spent a lot of time in Cornell activities. Okay. So what type of things do you do for Cornell and when you do alumni? Well, alumni association, we have, you know, massive um, Cornell's one of the largest alumni associations in the world. Mm -hmm. China, it, it's everywhere. You know, Cornell was a very uh, outgoing university. Cornell, as most people don't realize, is the third largest money raising university in the country. Mm -hmm. After, after uh, Harvard and Stanford. Okay, interesting. I'm learning so much. <laughs> we, we went on a cruise uh, in 1994 with uh, some professors and also the president of Cornell, the, the then president of Cornell, Frank Rhodes. And when 
at the end of our trip when we were in Istanbul, we actually had a meeting with the Cornell Club in, in Turkey. Cornell Club in Turkey. Of Turkey. And there were 65 yeah. people that Turkey came shows. from all parts of Turkey that had been alums of Cornell at that time. There were, there were alumni associations all over. Mm -hmm. And Cornell obviously became a big part of our family. One of our daughters went to Cornell, and three of our grandchildren. Two are graduating next week. Two are graduating from two Cornell more, next two week. Two grandchildren. Oh, so we didn't three talk grand, about it. Yeah. Three grandchildren. We have five grandchildren. Three went to Cornell, one's at John Hopkins, and one's still at public school in New York. Oh, okay. <laughs> So we got them in there. Yeah. You mentioned kids, because <laughs> if they're looking at it, you know, some of the things that you might do with this is have the family look. So we want to make well, sure. Well, the interesting thing is that um, we spent most of our, when the children were young, we, most of our Jewish activities was served to, uh, around my grand, my, my father and, and the family. Is that correct? Yeah. We had most, I mean, we did not belong to a, a synagogue here in Stanford because every important holiday we were with my parents. And they were nearby, they were just in the Maranek, so we went down there. And there was a, um, it, I think it's the Westchester Jewish Center that's right, the abutting property where my, which was my, originally my grandfather's property where my father lived. And um, they, um, there was, it was an estate at the time, that when we lived there it was 25 acres, but then the Westchester Jewish Center took over. They had a little um, synagogue there. So on all the important holidays, they cut a hole in the fence so my father could go across, and that's where we spent the holidays in this uh, Orthodox uh, synagogue. So we didn't really join here until my parents were older and spending a lot of time in Florida, and then we got involved more with uh, the fellowship. The, the fellowship with the, yeah. And you are involved with the fellowship, yeah. if you'd like that. The Fellowship yes. for Jewish Learning? Yes. So about when did you affiliate with that? I would say uh, about 1987, around that time. Okay. Approximately. My Jewish activities became uh, twofold. I was a, on the board of the American Jewish Committee for quite a few years. How did you get involved with that? Just people I knew and uh, believed in a lot of the things they were working on. Okay. And at the same time, I guess the other something happened at Cornell, which got me involved in a different direction. They asked me, I had never been to Hillel in my life at Cornell. It was, it was uh, mostly Orthodox. Okay. And you just didn't go there. I didn't even know where it was. And somebody came up to me and said, you know, you were head of the alumni association. You're the guy that can do it. Let's build a Hillel house at Cornell. So you see what you can do. So I, formed a committee, worked for two years, raised up uh, eight million dollars to build the hill out, do the plans, had everything ready. And it went to the board of trustees and I got a call and said they decided they don't want the Hill House on campus. So <laughs> that became an interesting part of my life. So what I did was I guess I did two things. Uh, one, I raised money so we could have a hill at Cornell, not a house, but we decided we would run our hill out of a campus facility, mm -hmm. but we would really invigorate it. We raised quite a bit of money, and hill Hill at Cornell became a very active thing. Still doesn't have a house. The only hill at a major college that doesn't have a house, but it's a very active Yeah, and our grandchildren are very involved in it. So that was, that was a very Jewish activity. The other Jewish activity I got into was from the American Jewish Committee. There was a political fight at the top, and the head of it was sort of released. It's political. And he, through a series of steps, became president of Hebrew College. So I got on the board of Hebrew College and spent 13 years on that board. And Vice chair, and you know, it was very active at Hebrew College. We built the new Hebrew College up in Newton, Mass. Newton, Mass, okay. So that, that took a lot of time. Yeah. But as a, on, on the basis that it's Hillel, 
saving the Hill Island Corn Hill, not the building. The, uh, I got involved with National Hill and uh, got on the board of National Hill Island and on the executive committee and been on for at least 14 years now. What is the status now of Hill Island in the country? It's extremely strong. Uh, and that's not just the country. What people don't understand, Hill Island is not just this country. We have 27 Hill Islands in the former Soviet Union. We have 11 Hill Islands in Israel. We have seven, hill, six Hill Islands in South America. And of course, we have hundreds of Hill Islands in the US and Canada. The big thing now is Israel on campus fighting off the Muslim challenge. Many of the campuses, most of the campuses are being challenged by Muslim student groups. And the big thrust now for Hill and all is Israel on campus. We have Israel interns now on, I think this year was 35 campuses, next year will be probably 50. And we've really worked hard to counteract the Muslim influence on the kids. They're trying to obviously delegitimatize Israel. Mm -hmm. Hillel plays a major role in trying to uh, resist that. So you did get some recognition as being involved with Hillel? Yeah, we've got the big Hillel Award at one time. Uh, I think I'm the first Cornell Alumni oh. Service Award. Mm -hmm. uh, Hillel's been very satisfying. Right now I'm quite involved in UConn Club. And we've really done good things here. We have a very, very good executive, young executive director, and it's possible that people will be, you know, we just refurbished the house there, and it's a, it's a thriving little community at UConn. Great. So. And you, uh, were you both involved with the uh, Council of Churches and Synagogues? I was on the board for a number of years, yes, and it was at the time where they had the uh, major um, national um, council that, that came here and it was it was in the planning for two years um, I was on the um, program committee with Rabbi Emily Kwisnick for two years we met every month for two years with with leaders that came all over planning we had about 80 seminars and everything. it was a, just a very big undertaking it was held at what was then the Sheraton downtown oh, it's had many names yeah it, okay. And it was uh, over, I think, was a two or three day uh, mm -hmm. uh, conference. And that was a, a big undertaking. And then the fellowship, with Rabbi Emily's uh, uh, insistence, of, she's always into new, th new things, uh, had an alliance with the uh, Bethel AME Church downtown. And both Mort and I were started with that when she originally had this alliance when Reverend Hill was uh, the pastor there. And we used to meet once a month and talk about Jewish-black uh, relations, get to know each other better, and um, raise money for scholarships, which we actually uh, are sort of winding down at this point. But we've been doing it all these years, giving scholarships each year to the people in the community to send them to, to college. So I've been on that the whole time, you know, working with, with that. Um, we would have the uh, kids come up for a skating party once a year. You know, we had all kinds of activities for them. Very interesting working with them. Got to know them really well, too, because we, we would have alumni. You know, the children who went on to college would come back and meet with us, so we got to know them. <coughs> that was really a great thing. Uh, Rabbi Emily um, had instigated a lot of uh, special programs with that group. We did something at West Hill one time. We had all kinds of things going on, aside from our <coughs> monthly meetings that we had. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, right. And involved with the fellowship, you've also been involved with um, the shelters? Yeah, we, uh, well, outreach, you know, whatever needs to be done, whatever you do in a congregation to reach out to the community. Uh, yeah, I got involved in that. I don't know, have we mentioned everything that you guys have been doing? No, I, <laughs> you've left that one. Uh, I know, you've, I want, I'm waiting for you to tell me. Well, also, just, just going back to, uh, going back a little bit, is that I, I think our children were very much influenced by my father, uh, you know, in terms of religion, wouldn't you say? Yeah. I think that, you know, generally made a big, big impression on their lives, more than, say, we would ourselves, because <coughs> with them living in Maranek, 
being so close. We went with them every weekend. We did things with my father and mother all the time. And um, my father was a very, very big influence on our kids and <coughs> really helped them to mm -hmm. uh, find their Jewish identity, which is very strong, especially our youngest daughter. With her four children, they're conservative. They belong to the Najes room in New York and keep kosher and you know, observe everything you can imagine. I mean, they're really very, very involved in the Jewish community. <laughs> yeah, so they're. And I think, I think a lot of that had to do with my father. So you were going to tell me? Well, I guess the thing that's probably <coughs> pertinent here is my Jewish activities in Stanford. Yes. <coughs> and that started. Uh, Do you want to I got in. Uh, I started believing that the, the thing that was most important in Jewish continuity was Jewish education, understanding Jewish uh, history and, and Jewish tradition. And the thing that I noticed was we didn't do much on Jewish education. So I said, I, would, I, I had never done anything for Federation or you know, part of the community. I said, the one thing I'm really interested in is getting Jewish education here. That's when I was on the board of Hebrew College, and we, I guess I worked with Ron Gross and several other people mm -hmm. to, to decide that we were going to really get into Jewish education and spend some money and some time on it. And I was fortunate that through contacts I had at the Hebrew College, we found somebody by the name of Juan Delaney <coughs> and con convinced her to come up here and convinced the uh, Federation that that was a worthy addition. I, I think that's really when the time that Jewish education took off here, which was eight years ago. Unfortunately, <coughs> I was leaving this year, but I think it's been a a noteworthy eight years. The community sees Jewish education very different. And uh, I think we're fortunate the new woman, Elise, who's coming up here from Houston, is going to be very good. So it, it won't suffer, but uh, it's been, I think, <coughs> an interesting change in the community to see how much, how many people now go to educational things. And on a tapestry uh, Saturday night, you know, we can get 300 people you know, thinking about it to take classes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think people see it differently now. And the Mel Melton School is part well, of that. We had, before we had Melton, we had Mayo. Mayo was the, uh, right. the little more rigorous course from Hebrew College. We ran out of people who wanted to take the more rigorous course, so we went to Melton. But a lot of people <coughs> have gone through Melton and graduated. And how about the Jewish High School? I guess the latest. Yeah. I guess the thing that uh, thing that I'm most involved in now, well, two things I'm most involved in. Uh, it's, it's strange to say we have day schools in New Haven and Greenwich and Stanford, but there's no Jewish high school. There wasn't a Jewish high school anywhere between Greenwich and New Haven. So we started on this quest. Uh, two and a half years ago, I didn't start it. It was a woman, Susan Fiedler, who really she got an award. She's an incredible person. But they started this, and I got involved, and unfortunately, we were able to raise enough money. We started the school. This is the first full year. The school had a good year. We had 19 students. What grade were they? Ninth graders. Ninth graders. Although we had one senior, oddly enough, and we He's going to graduate. Today. She's going to graduate. But it was essentially ninth graders. The new class is coming in. We just had a an interesting transition. The head of school resigned a month ago, which was somewhat of a surprise. But it turns out now that we got this wonderful new person that's really going to be good. I mean, I think it's going to go up a level now. And it's, it's already taking hold. I just had a call just this morning. People have heard about this new head of school, and we're starting to get new applications. So mm -hmm. now we've got to raise money for the second year, but it's uh, the Jewish high school is up and running. I think that's awfully important. The other thing I'm involved in is the uh, YISA, which is the Yale 
Institute for the Interdisciplinary Study of Antisemitism. Yeah. And that's been a, an interesting experience. Uh, it's the only school, only college in the country that studies anti-Semitism. Colleges study Holocaust, they study all kinds of other Jewish peripheral things, but nobody studies anti-Semitism. But this group, and uh, I think we're just going to get uh, another five-year uh, tenure up at Yale, which should come to any week now, is really serious about this. And we had a conference this year, we had 220 scholars from around the world who study anti-Semitism. And if I talk about one issue that I think really uh, is serious for the Jews now, anti-Semitism is definitely becoming more and more virulent around the world. And something's going to have to be contended with. And you you got to understand it. you got to see what's happening mm -hmm. to, to know how to fight it. Right. So speaking of anti-Semitism, before we get to that question, um, we just wanted to have on record where the Jewish High School of Connecticut is located. It's located in Bridgeport, mm -hmm. on the Bridgeport-Fairfield border, which is halfway between. New Haven in Greenwich. Okay. It's a temporary, it's in a synagogue, mm -hmm. reasonable quarters, but obviously at some time we're going to have to build the school. Yeah. It's a, yeah. well, it's, it's not a denominational school. Okay. And it's one of, there's 13 of these around the country now, non denominational high schools. The first one was in Boston, which I was happily involved in from Hebrew College. but. It's a, it's a really a model now of what the Jewish high schools are going to be. Uh, going back a little bit of history, as far as you mentioned anti-Semitism, did you ever find in your lifetime um, anti-Semitism passing your Definitely. pathways? Definitely. All the time. What, what kind? Give me an idea. Um, when I was in elementary school, um, there were very few Jews in Lachman at the time, Lachman Manic area. And I think nobody even knew that I was Jewish. If they found out, they would just be all, you know, like I was a stranger. And I was called names going to school, calling all kinds of names when I would, I would walk to school and walked up the driveway to the school and kids on both sides would be calling me names. Uh, I got along with everybody, but it was, you know, I, I, I knew that it was their parents' influence. Even at that young age, I knew that. It had nothing to do with them in particular. Uh, I was excluded from almost everything. Um, at one point, I was invited to a junior league dance, and when the uh, mother of the boy found out who I was, I, they had, I had, was disinvited because they didn't have Jews at the dance. I went to join the Philadelphia skating. I couldn't join any skating clubs in the area at all. Couldn't join any yacht clubs. I was a sailor. Could not join any yacht clubs at all. I was an uh, independent member of the Yacht Racing Association of Long Island. We lived right near the Larchemont Yacht Club. I was not allowed to walk in the building with my friends. I had to stay outside. It was just constant. And I, I just generally became very shy because I was very shy when I was young, just sort of, sort of in my own little shell, protect, I guess protecting myself. And it was like two different worlds. My grandfather had a lovely state in, in the Maranac, and when I was out of that area, I was one person. And as soon as I went through and went in there, where my grandparents lived and we lived right on the same property, it was a different world. It was a totally different world. Mm -hmm. So I adapted to it. It didn't bother me at all. I was, that was a fact of life. I was taught, you know, how to handle it. My father and grandfather had to handle it too, you know, in their business. I went to join the Philadelphia Skating Club and I had all the proper uh, identification and everything I needed to join a club like that and I was introduced and the whole thing. And then when I went in to be interviewed, I was told right to my face that, um, well, you should really withdraw your application. They realized that I didn't know that I shouldn't be trying to get into that club. And uh, they said you should draw, withdraw your application because your name will go up on the uh, board. and. We have 800 members, and, and if you have one black ball, you'll be out. And I can tell you that as soon as they find out you're Jewish, you, you won't. So just please re withdraw your application. So I went home, and I called my father. He said, don't worry, we'll get you in. So 
we figured out that because I was a college student at the time, I could get a college pass to go to skate. As long as I wasn't a full member, you know, I didn't mix with them. <laughs> I was okay to skate, you know, so I got a pass with a punch card. And nobody knew I was Jewish. I didn't have a Jewish name. And uh, I, you know, didn't have any outward signs that I was Jewish, so I was one of them. <laughs> but those, that, those kind of things happened all the time, as I remember. Did your children experience anything, Anthony? Not at no. all. Not at all. In here, in Stanford. I don't yeah. think Stanford. I mean, I, I discussed it with them. I asked. Here in Stanford. It was one of the reasons we moved to Stanford. Was a very mixed community of all kinds of people and all kinds of never, nationalities. I never had we really liked the idea. Never had an incident in college. All the fraternities and sororities were segregated. You had Jewish fraternities and Jewish sororities, which is not the case now. They're mixed. But things have really changed because if I go back to Larchmont now, oh, yeah, the right. clubs that you couldn't go into, one of them that was well, the hardest to get into at <laughs> all hard, is, is now a Jewish club. <laughs> Predominantly Jewish, not all Jewish. So I think things have really changed in this country, anti Semitism. Yeah, and I know my father and grandfather being, uh, a, you know, a law and financial printing. I had to deal with law firms who were didn't have any Jewish lawyers, and they had to prove that they were as good or better than anybody else, and so they really worked hard to have a product that to show these law firms that they should use them, they, and they they did that. Mm -hmm. they, their clients were some of the largest law firms in New York, of Bass, Wayne Moore, and all of those you know large law firms, and they got to learn how, you know what a Jew was. <laughs> So, no. it, was very it was very different then. I was one of the few, you know, rose fairly quickly and became a manager. And it was one of the few Jews. And there was only one prohibition. You couldn't go to the Saudi Arabia. Uh. At that time, it was, well, I think it's still a little gone. I'm not sure they let Jews go in on a path. But they never had problems. I mean, they treated me fine. And even large my in school. I, you had troubles. Yeah, I, I, and I, by the time I got to high school, I, I went never, through the school system and it was... I never had, never had problems. I yeah, but I, I remember Mort's sister and I, when we went into high school, they had sororities there, which was really strange thing. <laughs> sororities in high school, two sororities, and they, of course, didn't pledge Jews. So my first year there in 10th in grade, 9th um, grade, 10th grade, and um, they would... Uh, pledge kids, and of course I wasn't asked at all because they didn't have Jews, but there was the president of the sorority lived next door to my best friend who she was fine with it, and she hated the, the whole thing and she actually got the, the, um, the either the charter or whatever it was changed and the next year they said they were going to be able to take Jews in that particular sorority in that high school. So both um, my sister and I pledged. And there was also this question, I was discussed it with my father, should I join and, or shouldn't I? I mean, the, you know, I said, well, I don't want to, you know, say no to them just because they're open. Like, you know, they were all my friends. By that time, I had lots of friends. Didn't matter who I was, but the sorority still didn't accept Jews, but then they changed and we both joined that sorority. So uh, it was very different. I was just about, I think it was just the two of us and one other Jewish girl that went into the sorority. Were you going to say something else about? No, I just, I had very little. Oh. I was fortunate right through. I didn't have trouble. Right. Okay. I think it's harder for girls, too, because they can be very gossipy and very yeah. catty. And they can make it difficult for each other. Right. So um, one of the things I'd also like to have included in our video is the, your, your hobbies and some of your... <laughs> things that you do in your spare time when you're not volunteering? Fun stuff. I'm, Fun stuff. I'm a, a steam addict. My business was, when I was an investment banker, I worked with railroads. I was on the board of six railroads. I loved trains and loved model trains and stuff. As you as you see when you come in the house, we built the railroad around the house, and I built those engines, and I have a machine shop and spent a lot of time in the machine shop building. And this is all trains. from scratch? 
The models are all from scratch and the cars are built, they're not from scratch, but they're built from a lot of the parts and stuff. We're built. The Stanley Steamer is out in the garage. But the trains are built from scratch. The, the, the steam engines. From scratch and the the steam, steam engines. engines. Milling the parts and everything. That's, that's smart. And you showed me your garden. Is that and your other? I think it's my garden, my hostage garden. Well, Mort took over from me. Uh, I spent a good amount of time while Mort was working long hours. I, was, I took care of the property. Didn't have a garden or anything. Just took care of everything. Washing the windows, cleaning the gutters, you name it. Uh, fall, spring cleanup, and planting the flowers, and, and just general, all the time. Mm -hmm. I was the gardener. And then my knees went, I <laughs> couldn't kneel anymore, and it just became too difficult for me, and uh, what took over. Okay. It became a hostage feed. <laughs> <laughs> now you have hobbies. Yeah, lots, lots of hobbies. <laughs> well, um, I love to ice skate. I used to play a lot of tennis, you know, all the time, winter, summer, and uh, sailed, and then um, well, because I went to art school, I've done all kinds of art, you know, whether it's graphic arts or uh, oil painting, and and I uh, I don't really do anything professionally. I've never done anything professionally with it, but I designed all my children's invitations and, and um, birth, birth announcements and uh, bar mitzvah invitations and you name it, you know, to, just do whatever is needed. Um, and have worked with my grandchildren with that. There's uh, quite a few of them are very good artists themselves. And so when I, we visit, we just have art projects that we do. Uh, music is probably one of my biggest interests at all. I love to play piano. Uh, I taught my children, four children, piano for quite a, lot, a number of years. My youngest daughter, when she was 14, showed a very big interest in playing. And I got her a teacher from Juilliard who took her on as a teenager, and uh, she went to Manhattan School of Music, has a master's in music piano performance. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and all the children are very musical, and my grandchildren are all very musical, so music is a very, very big part of my life. Um, I uh, did some weaving years ago, hoped to get back to it, and played another, other, other instruments, harpsichord, classical guitar. Um, what else? Mm -hmm. Art. <laughs> We collect art. I collect art, yeah. <laughs> Collecting. Both of you? Or yeah. yeah. It's a pretty serious art collection from around the world. We've collected every time we traveled. We've collected and, uh, a pretty fair collection of interesting art. Okay. So, um, is there anything that you might want to tell us that I haven't asked you? Have have we covered all the bases? I think you're pretty comprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I've enjoyed it. So now we can say that you've, you're being honored by the Jewish Historical Society on June 12th, 2011. And the theme for our um, event is humanity, mm -hmm. harmony, and heritage. And you really cover all of those items, and that's why we feel it's a very good uh, culmination of you in our, in our lives for the the community and for the country. You know, I think it's important that the Historical Society has really taken a look at itself and thought about where it wants to go and what its themes are going to be. And that's the reason I really did this was because I think you are in a good direction. I think it's an important uh, adjunct to the community. Right. Thank you. We, we are honored. We are truly honored that you accepted this honor. Wow. And uh, the fact is that um, we are trying to be education, which is something that you embody. Mm -hmm. The Jewish Historical Society does want to be education to the community and be there and work with the other agencies yep. to build and collaborate. So I thank you very much. Thank and you. I think this is going to be wonderful. We will mm -hmm. give you a DVD for you to share with your family, mm -hmm. and there will be one that we will keep in the archives. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, this was from an American Jewish Community trip where we went with a small group and we visited the, the, the camps in Poland. And then we went to Italy and visited the Pope. And interestingly enough, 
of course, he's a very articulate in English. And he gave us a full hour, and we just got a chance to talk to him. In fact, one of the women asked him, he was telling us about him, one of his, his recreations was skiing. And this woman, I'll never forget, asked him, well, what do you wear when you ski in your own Yeah, the Hawaii classic guy. But he, he's a very congenial person, and you can talk to him. And, you know, he's very interested in... Do you have a date? Do you remember when yes, that date was? Yes, it was 1990, uh, February 1990. Yep. Do I have a date on that? But I, I remember it was in February 1990. We went with a rabbi from New York, Rabbi Rudin, and he led the group. And it was mainly the uh, officers of the American Jewish Committee, and Mort was on one of the committees. Okay. All right, so tell us about this picture. I am christening the Eleanor F. Moran uh, tugboat of the Moran Towing Company in uh, Maine. It's okay. Go ahead. Tell us about that. And here the uh, tug has uh, gone down uh, out into the bay, uh, or ready to go to Texas, where it is right now. Why they name it after you? Uh, Mort was on the board of the Moran Towing Company, and we got a call from the if we would like to uh, have a tug name for us. And we said, lovely. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, she hasn't done it. Okay. Yeah, I understand something you want to add to what you said before. My uh, father was knighted by Pope John XXIII uh, in 1964 for his work with the Catholic Church. Uh, my father was uh, concerned during the Cold War of people not believing in God, of atheism, communism, and so anybody who believed in God, no matter what the religion, he felt that this was very important to combat communism. And uh, he did some printing for the uh, Catholic universities uh, to help their education. You said um, the uh, president of Duquesne University and some of the other priests would always come to our uh, seders in the Maronite. Uh, they would travel from Pittsburgh to come to our seders. We were very friendly with them.